bringing uh, public policy to the attention of the local community and to businesses in the community, uh, that we can get that feedback and really be following public policy that is good for our community and good for, for our businesses. So we really appreciate you being here and getting involved and being engaged with the Chamber in this way. With that, I'll turn it back over to Terry. Thank you, Lori. I just want to point out and um, do a shout out to our sponsors because these these types of meetings would not be um, without them. So we have APS, SRP, Southwest Gas, Dragon Walk, Intel, Air Products, and Catalyst Computer Technologies. So because this is the beginning of the year, I want to do a few introductions. You know I am very big on interns, and we have stellar interns that go on to some pretty amazing positions here within Arizona. I think our last um, intern and, and individual that we had is now with the Corporation Commission as one of their head lobbyists, so love that. So I'd like to introduce Jason Johnson. Where is, oh, Jason's the one that met you when you came in. Jason's, um, he is, his declared major is in public administration. He's a sophomore at NAU. He works at PayPal and really helps out with our local ICANN. Ashley Cisneros is right over here. You're going to hear from her a little bit later. Um, Ashley's working on her master's in government and public policy at Grand Canyon. And she's actually worked for the City of Phoenix and also the community economic development for the City of Phoenix. And she's also been involved with the Forest City program. And then we also have Chad Porman over here and you'll get to meet him, he'll, he'll say a few words. And Chad is a JD candidate um, at Mitchell Hamlin um, School of Law. He graduates in May of 2019. He's actually working under our legal counsel. So we're very, very fortunate to have him with us. And so he's had a real eye-opener um, here, and so we're really pleased to have them. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Brianza, and he'll go ahead and finish. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and uh, Happy New Year to those who I uh, have not have seen me earlier, so uh, we'll get this thing going. I think we're going to dispense this morning because of, we've got 80 people registered for this, and we'll dispense with introductions around the rooms and uh, jump right into this. We have a for a full schedule, so let's get started. Um, I'd like to turn around at this time and turn it over to Chad to introduce our first uh, speaker. Chad. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here with you all. Let me get that little, little thing out of the way there. Our next speaker is no stranger to the Arizona business community. Uh, in fact, he's, he's one of its closest allies. Eric Taylor. Senior Vice President of Government Relations and Communications at the Arizona Chamber, serves as their lead advocate at all levels of government and the main liaison between the Chamber and the media. Garrett previously served as Public Affairs Consultant, directing communications for the Arizona Republican Party during a U.S. Senate race, overseeing public policy efforts for a major trade organization, and serving as a congressional staff member. Derek has been quoted in media outlets across the country, and I know I've learned a lot. Uh, he's clarified a lot of positions for me through his writing, and, and we're fortunate to have him here with us today. Let's give him a warm Chandler welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. A lot of familiar faces. I'm a Chandler resident, so I'm happy to come to the local chamber. Appreciate all the good work that Terry does. Members of the council, thanks for being here today. Uh, Mayor Harkey, thank you for doing this. Every year, the Arizona Chamber kicks off the legislative session with, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think we called it, it was an intimate luncheon that we had you at recently. There were about 1,300 people. Uh, uh, the mayor provided the invocation that day, and we really appreciate you being on hand to uh, kick off the year in the right way. So thanks for doing that. I appreciate having you there. Uh, you have some great education leaders in the room today as well. Rosalie in the house. Let's give a big hand to Rosalie. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, Arizona State here, uh, the main, uh, a true economic and educational driver in this community as well. So thank everybody from ASU that's here today. All right, let's talk about what's going on at the Capitol this year. It's going to be a busy year. Every year is. Um, if you saw Rocky Three and the Clubber Lang was asked for a prediction, he said, pain. So that's what, uh, this is not easy work that we have to get going here. Most of you know what the Chamber does. We try to make Arizona as competitive as possible. We support policies at the state capitol. 
to that end, and we also support candidates who will support this mission. All right, what do we do? Advocacy, we're at the Capitol, engaged in face-to-face -face lobbying, political engagement, that means campaign season. Industry coalitions, we hope that we can serve as an umbrella group wherever possible for other industry groups and who represent employers. Networking and events, we just talked about that. And then we have a foundation, I'll touch on that in a little bit. That's our research arm. Uh, we put a lot of uh, analyses out that hopefully guide uh, the understanding of some sometimes difficult issues. All right, what's going on at the legislature? Things are different. The Arizona House breakdown is down 31, 29 in favor of the Republicans. Uh, the Republicans having the majority is not terribly newsworthy, but the margin is 31, 29. So if you're in the majority party, you can only lose, uh, if you lose one vote, you're now, it's tied and a bill dies. So caucus discipline, if you're in leadership, becomes very important when you think about uh, whether a bill is going to pass or fail. The number of Republican losses is in November changed the makeup of the House. You saw it happen right here in the district that we're in and next door in districts 17 and 18, things changed. New members of the legislature elected next door in legislative district 18, where I live, that's gone. A, uh, it's a completely Democratic representative that's split over here in 17, but it's resulted in this 31 and 29 margin. So caucus discipline is gonna be very interesting to watch on some tough issues. So if you're looking to kill a bill, you just need to pull off uh, one member of the majority party. You've got a, you've got a tie ball game. <laughs> Closest divide since 1966. Lawmakers from either party can easily influence debate. There's a few committees that I highlighted for you here that uh, give you a sense of uh, some of the, the partisan breakdowns, appropriations, education, energy and natural resources. Those are big, important committees this year because of the issue set that the uh, legislators are going to be dealing with. And so members of that committee have a lot of influence in shaping the debate that will shape Arizona, not only this year, but in years to come. There's the leadership. Uh, on the left, you've got your Republican leadership, Rusty Bowers from Mesa, Warren Peterson from Gilbert, Becky Nutt from Southeastern Arizona, mostly rural district. If you look on the right-hand side there, you see the, the Democratic caucus leadership. It is not a Phoenix-centric uh, leadership team. It represents the entire state. The minority leader, Charlene Fernandez, is from Yuma. Dr. Freeze from Tucson. Reggie Bolding from the district that is South Mountain and South Phoenix. And Athena Salmon from Tempe is the minority whip. So you see how things are shaking out there just from a geographic standpoint and the constituencies that they are representing. Keep in mind the minority leader being from Yuma, we're gonna talk a little bit about water policy this year. Uh, if you represent a ag heavy district like Yuma County, these are things that are going to influence your thinking about these tough issues and that certainly affects the minority leader. The Senate stayed the same. The margin, we went into the election with a 17-13 Republican majority, and it came out 17-13. So the numbers didn't change. And in fact, the Senate in 2019 is going to have a lot of members who are mostly veteran lawmakers. They were either reelected to the Senate or they moved over from the House to the Senate. There's only one true freshman in the Senate this year. Uh, Senator Tyler Pace, he's from Mesa. Some of you might remember Bob Worsley from Mesa who left the legislature. It was Tyler Pace who took that seat. So again, only they really only the true freshmen in that bond. Here's how you see the Senate leadership shake out. Again, statewide representative Karen Fan is from Legislative District 1. That's Prescott, Yavapai County, down in Black Canyon City. Rick Gray from the West Valley. Sonny Morelli from Mojave County. David Bradley, the minority leader in the uh, in the Senate, longtime lawmaker from Tucson, Lupe Contreras uh, from West Phoenix, Tavisita Peshlik High from uh, Northeastern Arizona, uh, LD7. All right, what's the chamber working on in 2019? Water, taxes, ballot initiatives, civil justice, education, uh, all with their own degree of difficulty. Uh, this is an interesting issue set in this regard. The legislative session is typically, typically lasts about 100 days every year. 
In this case, though, we're going to know whether we have a successful session on our hands probably within the first 30 days. Because these top two items here, securing the water future and this clarity on taxes, we have to get those done soon. The clock is ticking on these. For those of you who have followed some of the back and forth in the media over water, for example, you get the sense of urgency that is emerging over that. The Arizona Chamber and most of the business community is strongly supporting something called the Drought Contingency Plan. Uh, there's been a lot of media coverage over this. Uh, I want to be clear that by passing the, the Drought Contingency Plan, it's not as if all of our water problems are solved. We still have we still have drought. We still have the natural tension between water users, agribusiness, cities, the development community. That doesn't go away. But this sets us up for perhaps a smoother glide path into some of these longer term negotiations over what our, what our water future looks like. I was just reading a story that was uh, that Channel 15 posted on its website. And they, they uh, called Lake Mead and Lake Powell sort of the bank account of water. I think that's a fair description. There's a lot of customers at that bank, though. All these Colorado River users, lower basin users like California, Arizona, Nevada, upper basin uh, states like Washington, Colorado, they have a uh, claim on this Colorado River water as well. Uh, if you are in a prayerful mood, and Pastor Hartke's here, he can help us with that, uh, pray for snow this winter because that's a lot so because of that that fills up that, that water bank. So what the drought contingency plan does is it sets us up for this longer term negotiation and it, it staves off a dangerously low level water level in Lake Mead. Now our concerns if we were not to as basin states enter into the DCP, we invite federal intervention, meaning that Arizona would have less say over its water future and we would be inviting the Bureau of Reclamation to come in and manage it for us. And uh, in natural resource policy, uh, state leadership is typically better than handing the keys over to Washington, D.C., because it's less likely that a D.C. bureaucracy is going to recognize the subtleties of Arizona's own particular challenges in the areas of de development and, and uh, agriculture. On the third bullet point there, we note the January 31st deadline. The U.S. Bureau of Federal Reclamation has been very clear that the lower basin states, including Arizona, have got to sign on to the D.C.P. by the end of January. Well, other states are ready to go, so what's Arizona's problem? Arizona is unique in that we're the only state in these, in these basin states that requires a legislative approval, a legislative authority for our Department of Water Resources to enter into these multi-state agreements. And so that adds a new level of complication. You've got to get something passed, a joint resolution of the legislature to get this done. On that last bullet point, I mentioned that our foundation policy briefs are a great resource. If you want to strip out uh, partisan rhetoric and back and forth over one particular uh, industry or another, go on the website for the Arizona Chamber Foundation. There are some very easy to read digestible uh, briefs about water policy that uh, I'll tell you, first and foremost, water policy is very difficult. So these sort of broad overviews are very helpful. If you are a legislator and you're contemplating water right now, we hope that you are acting with a sense of urgency to get this done by January 31st. Because again, if we don't hit that, we are inviting federal rulemaking, greater intervention, and even a potential lawsuit from upper basin states for our own foot dragging here uh, at the lower basin. If you're, in, if you're approaching this from a position of horse trading, what can I as a lawmaker get out of the drought contingency plan? What can I trade? We would hope that you would not pursue horse trading in this issue. What are you getting for the passage of the drought contingency plan? You're getting the DCP. You're getting greater water secure, security going forward. We want to avoid this getting wrapped up in highly partisan politics. Tax conformity, another issue. Uh, certain things in life uh, we know we can count on. That's death and taxes. You've all got to file your taxes by April the 15th. In December of 2017, Congress passed a major tax overhaul that uh, affected taxpayers going into tax year 18. So when you go on to TurboTax and you put your information in, what you, the forms that you're entering will already reflect the changes that have been made at the federal level. States, though, each year have to decide what elements of their own state tax code will they conform to the changes that the feds made. Well, Arizona every year adopts a tax conformity plan. 
it's pretty boring stuff. It's not a packed hearing room. They go in, they adopt the, the conformity changes, and they move on. It's not a hotly debated issue. This year is different. Because of the change to the federal level, there's going to be greater debate over what changes should be adopted at a state level. Uh, a legislator from this area who's the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, J.D. Mesnard, he wants to pursue a more aggressive conformity and reform package. He wants to marry these two and make sure that there are not certain taxpayers who, by virtue of not adopting certain changes at a state level, would have to potentially pay more uh, in their state taxes than was originally anticipated. The governor's office, in its opening gambit on in its budget package, has contemplated just a reform package that could result in more revenues coming into state coffers. And the governor's office has said, if that indeed is the case, we should divert those dollars into the rainy day fund to prepare for a future recession. So there's already some tension developing between the legislative branch and the executive branch over how should we approach these tax changes. The chamber's position is that this debate is gonna play out, it's gonna play out quickly, but we want to provide clarity for taxpayers. We want to, we want to make sure we are maintaining and enhancing, if possible, Arizona's competitive standing. We also want to do it in a way that's fiscally sound, fiscally prudent. Uh, this is an issue that needs to get done soon because tax day is coming. And in the uh, some of the debate that's already happened in some of these legislative hearings, you have law lawmakers saying, well, what am I supposed to tell my constituents when it comes to the time to file their state taxes? You can file as soon as January the 28th. The Department of Revenue, our State Department of Revenue, is already anticipating this. They're preparing forms in anticipation of some sort of conformity. But what it ultimately looks like has yet to be seen. So if we can at least provide some level of certainty for taxpayers going into tax season, we think that's really important. We don't want this whole, all of you to have to file amended tax returns because state lawmakers uh, upset the apple cart sometime in February. That would not be a good thing. Ballot initiative reform, this is important. Uh, last November, you saw a number of ballot measures that, uh, questions that appeared on the statewide ballot. Uh, out-of-state groups that came in and tried to advance their agenda here. Uh, going back uh, four years ago, we saw marijuana legalization paid for mostly with outside money. Just last year, outside dollars on the uh, solar energy initiative from Tom Steyer. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is the citizen's initiative process, which is really part of Arizona's DNA, has it been manipulated by outside interests? Is Arizona's um, citizen initiative process, does it not have a sufficient number of guardrails around it? Have we left ourselves wide open for monkey business from outside groups? So a few years ago, the chamber worked on a set of packages that you see on the left here, where we tried to tighten up the citizen's initiative process. For example, moving to a strict compliance standard of judicial review. All that means is that if there are errors, and grave errors that are made in a, in a ballot petition or in the language itself, a judge should be able to intervene in that and, if necessary, remove something from the ballot. Because after all, what's driving our position on this? Passing bills at the ballot box by voters, it's lawmaking. That is a form of lawmaking. Now, if the legislature does something, passes a bill, and there's some unintended consequence, they just come back into session and they fix it. When it comes to ballot questions, we in Arizona uh, we really can't do that because of something called our Voter Protection Act. If something's adopted at the ballot box, if the legislature wants to amend that, it has to achieve a three-fourths vote of the legislature. Good luck doing that. And it has to advance the original intent of the, of the question we're, we're contemplating. It's not clear how you would do that. So we have to be very judicious in how we approach these ballot questions and make sure that there are uh, sufficient guardrails around it. We work to eliminate the paper signature compensation model, which we thought was incenting uh, quantity over quality of signatures. We've all you know, been outside the library or the grocery store and we've been approached by these signature gatherers. And gatherers. We're not, it's not always clear what their intent is. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're not exposing the ballot box, uh, and that these questions are not exposing the state to irreparable harm for the reasons we just discussed. So I would anticipate 2019, you'll see the business community work with stakeholders on things like the Secretary of State's role in paid signature gatherers, when groups come in from out of state to gather signatures for pay, what are they attesting to? 
do they have uh, criminal convictions that likely should bar them from engaging in this sort of activity? Uh, the question is, uh, another question we were gonna consider is, when you're gathering signatures to send a question to the ballot, should you have to get a requisite number of signatures from around the entire state? Paid signature gathering in Arizona right now is mostly a Greater Phoenix and Greater Tucson phenomenon. If you're in Heber Overgard, you are very unlikely to encounter a paid signature gathering to send something to the statewide ballot. So a lot of rural Arizona does not have much of a say in whether to send some of these controversial questions to the ballot. So are we, have we set this up the right way? And this is an area for reform. We think it is. Now, I should say that we're very limited in some of the reforms we can pursue because if we want to make even more ambitious reforms, we'd have to go back to Arizona voters. And the time and the place for that election is uh, TBD. We're going to see what we can do at the state level first. All right, at the federal government, what are we working on this year? Big one, USMCA ratification. Arizona is an exporting state, an importing state. We have a very healthy, sophisticated supply chain here with Mexico. Uh, think about some of the investments that are coming to the Southeast Valley and Central Arizona. Things like uh, Lucid Motors in Pinal County, building its electric car facility there. Well, why? One of the reasons they cited the supply chain for parts going back and forth between Arizona and, uh, and Mexico. They like the relationship, the proximity, and the ability to efficiently move goods between our state and Sonora. You go to the grocery store during cold weather months, you're able to get fresh produce uh, of, of all varieties. Why? Well, it's because of trade. It's because of the Nogales Mariposa Port of Entry, which the governor has proposed we should build a cold storage facility to continue to maintain our competitive standing there. What we don't want is that trilateral trade relationship to break down and to make it more expensive to go to the grocery store because there are tariffs on incoming goods. The USMCA preserves that trilateral framework of the, of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, updates it in a smart way, but Congress has to ratify it. The uh, Prime Minister of Canada, the outgoing President of Mexico, and President Trump all signed on to this thing, but now it requires legislative uh, ratification. Uh, as you probably noticed, there's not much going on in Washington, D.C. right now. And so these guys need to pick up the pace and reopen the government and get to some of this big legislative activity that's on their place. They can put on there. One of the things that's holding up this, uh, this government shutdown, uh, immigration reform, we are seeking a positive re resolution on DACA, including a path to citizenship. A couple of votes in the Senate yesterday failed to reopen the government, but it seems to have sparked uh, greater negotiation. We are hoping that the White House and Congress can, can get off the dime and get this government reopened, and we would like, as part of this, to get a positive resolution on DACA. Uh, some of you get our CEO's call, and we put it out yesterday. His position has basically been, make a deal if the, if the president wants uh, billions of dollars for border security that includes barriers, give it to them if you can get some guarantees on DACA, get a DACA resolution. The tax cuts, preserving and preserving those existing tax cuts and to continue our regulatory reform, that goes back to the tax package that we discussed earlier. Make sure that that stays in place from a federal level, uh, not only for competitive reasons, but for all of you for tax certainty. You don't need a big swinging changes in, in the tax code as you try to run your businesses in 2019. Uh, and infrastructure. The president has talked about his desire to get an infrastructure package, but it hasn't gone very far. If there is going to be a push for an infrastructure package, Arizona deserves a seat at the table for federal dollars. Make sure we get our fair share of our uh, tax, uh, the gas tax money we send back to Washington. We need to get some of that back to help pay for major projects like Interstate 11, widening of I-10 between California and Greater Phoenix. Uh, you've seen expansions uh, on I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson, I-19 between Tucson and Nogales, a major trade corridor. That needs uh, greater capacity as well. And we believe that if an infrastructure package emerges, Arizona needs to have a voice there. <coughs> There's my ugly mug there. All right, so I want to point something out here at the bottom, Chamber Business News. Uh, that is a project of our foundation. I don't have to tell you that the media landscape is changing 
uh, things are different in the world of print journalism and digital. Every day, Chamber Business News that's run out of our Chamber Foundation puts out an email at one o'clock. It's a digest of original reporting on business issues facing Arizona. It's a quick read. I recommend that you sign up for it. And there's a lot of good video features on there. A lot of interviews with lawmakers, uh, folks from within the executive branch. It's just a good digest for you to know what's going on, especially for a Chamber of Commerce crowd that cares about some of the intersection of policy and business. This is what you want to check out. Also, uh, the Arizona Chamber Foundation, as I mentioned, some very good overviews, analyses of difficult issues that helps the business community understand why these are important issues. It sort of takes off the advocacy hat and just puts on the rather dry academic analysis side. So that's what's going on in 2019. I will stop talking. Should we take questions now or should we? All right, Mike. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. What do you say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this point in time, I'd like to ask uh, Ashley Cisneros to come up and introduce our next speaker, please. Ashley. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Ashley Cisneros, public policy intern. I recognize a few familiar faces here in the room today. Um, I will be introducing to you Kevin, uh, Kevin Harkey, Chandler Mayor. Mayor Kevin Harkey began his term January 2019. He previously served nine years on the city council, first as interim council member, and then was elected and served two consecutive four-year terms. Kevin also served as vice mayor twice, Kevin is involved extensively in the state and region, serving on boards and committees with the Arizona League of Cities and Towns, Maricopa Association of Governments, Greater Phoenix Economic Council, and Regional Public Transportation Authority. He currently serves on the Chandler Chamber Board and the Public Policy Committee. Kevin and his wife, Lynn, have been married for 37 years and have lived in Chandler since 1985. He continues to serve as a pastor for, at Trinity Christian Fellowship in Chandler. He has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in theology. I've had the opportunity to work uh, together at the Forest City Chandler, and um, he is going to be great. He is a great asset to our community. Please give a round of applause for Mayor Hartman. I've had the privilege of working with Ashley for at least two or three of our back to school drives and, and others. So Chamber, you got a good find here. She's good. I see a lot of familiar faces. I see very few unfamiliar faces here. So I feel like amongst friends and it's good to have the opportunity to stand before you and not have to correct you by saying mayor elect. So it's good to be here. I do want to introduce, we have a couple of our council members and city staff here, uh, and I know our council members will have the opportunity to talk a little bit, but I'd still like to introduce them because I strongly see us as a team, Team Chandler, but also Team Council. We have and we will work together very well. So Vice Mayor Terry Rowe, <laughs> Council Member Jeremy McClinans, we have our city manager, Marsha Reed, here. Our intergov, Ryan Peters. Economic development, Micah Miranda. And executive director, Matthew Burdick. And I saw Matt Orlando here. It looks, uh, council member, it looked like he had to leave. I don't think I missed anyone. All right, no one's waving at me or frowning at me. That's a good sign. Once again, it's a privilege to be here this morning. I am on day 15 of being your mayor. As I like to say, in my, in my reign of 15 days, Chandler is neither imploded or exploded. So we want to see how long we can keep that string going, right? Maybe have one of those signs, no accidents have occurred for these many days. Ray, if I get too long-winded, just turn the music up, okay? So, as Chandler's 
one of the monikers that we continue to like to hang on to is the technology and innovation hub of the Southwest. We're a thriving city, and we continue to thrive on being a champion of innovation and emerging technologies. As many of you know, we are one of the few cities in the nation, 30 out of, I think Mike has told me, 42,000 towns and cities. Is that still correct, or am I off on that? 20,000. 20,000. Well, I don't want to super embellish. That's a pretty big embellishment. But 30 out of 20,000 uh, towns and cities in the nation with this AAA bond rating from all three rating agencies. And we boast having, I have a, I have a disagreement with our, our, new, uh, our new director of, of staff there. Are we the, the lowest cost of service because Gilbert raised their water bills? Or are we number two? I can always fall back and say, we are number one. Very good. I'm glad I, we had a little debate and our, we hired a person from Gilbert and she was still kind of hanging on to that perhaps. Or they just changed their uh, rates, their water rates just this past year so it hadn't gravitated up to where we could actually say that. But we, we boast of the lowest total cost of municipal services and taxes in the valley. We continue to rank as one of the best places to work in the nation as well as a top place for families in Arizona, one of the safest cities in all of the United States, as well as in the top 10 of most livable cities in America. Eric is a smart guy. That's why he lives in Chandler, amongst many other reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> so I do want to talk a little bit about who am I and what are you getting into for the next four years, eight years. So. I've been in Chandler since 85, as was mentioned. I've been a pastor, and I still serve part-time at Trinity Christian Fellowship, which is a mile east of here. And um, I came here from working with Cree, Ojibwe, Chippewaian Indians in northern Minnesota, as well as in uh, Canada, working with a Christian organization. Some of these were very high in suicides and a lot of social problems, and we found ourselves invited in by a collaboration of local churches as well as the tribes to, to come in and work uh, just with youth and children and families and what was going on there. I, I remember one of the villages that we were in was the suicide capital of Canada, uh, Shimano in Manitoba. And we were there when TV came in and uh, as a satellite dish. And it was fascinating because suddenly uh, kids didn't know that, that all-star wrestling was fake. So they were actually giving each other pile drivers and then uh, and those types of things and they were getting all sorts of accidents and it was a fascinating social time to be in that village and others. But we loved that. We came down here and started working at this church. We were thinking we're only going to be here for a couple years. Well, we fell in love with Chandler and back in about 1990, I, I took a group of students to a conference and and wondering should we look elsewhere and my wife and I strongly felt that this is the community where we were called to sink deep as roots as possible so we started serving more and volunteering and getting engaged and I met former mayor Tip Schraney when he was council member Tip Schraney uh, back in the late 80s and started volunteering to do things in this community which led to serving on some boards and commissions and getting more engaged and I remember one time where there was a murder outside the sidewalk of my church on McQueen of a, of a gang murder over there and I, I just felt this sense of this is wrong and the that was probably the first time that I ever stood before city council and, and found myself uh, just emotionally wound up and pounding a pulpit and say or the days and, and saying that we need to do something about this and not because I, of my words, but I was very, um, very proud of our, of our police who were already on top of that and they had cleaned out the neighborhood at that time. So I never saw myself as running for mayor in those days. I was very, very content and driven to do what I was doing and as, as directing the church, as working with nonprofits in our community. And, but after serving for uh, city council for four years during my second term, I. I felt that uh, this was something that seemed to fit my lifeline and timeline and sometimes it's that way and sometimes it's just you're in the right place at the right time. And uh, 
if Jack Sellers had not bested me on my very first run for city council by a couple hundred votes, who knows, Jack? Maybe you'd be standing up here now. <laughs> but we, we've always had a very cohesive council, and I look forward to continuing to do that. So what are some of the priorities of mine, our council, and the city's? Well, as your mayor, I'm very passionate and confident in, in all the things that our city is doing and that we have to offer. As you know, we're a great place to work and to, and to play and to live, and many enjoy a very vibrant life in our community. We've met recently, even as of last night, to discuss budget priorities and kind of giving a, a preset to our city manager in terms of just, these are the principles that as you develop a, a budget that will come back to us. But I, I was very pleased with our meeting last night. We had great discussions. We, we quickly came to an agreement in terms of conservative financial policies that will that have served, served Chandler well and will continue in the future. And we'll be meeting next month as a council to uh, examine our current priorities and goals as well as add to them or augment them in other ways. But we'll continue to focus on some of the, the very basic things that, that we do as cities, such as be fiscally responsible. It was very good last night that we affirmed that we'll continue to keep adequate reserves, both in a, a rainy day fund, 15%, as well as other funds. One is such in case our, our legislators ding us, whether it's on, on this area or another, there's, we see the possibility of up to $12 million that could affect us with some of the legislation going there. So we want to be able to have a reserve that in case that happens, we'll be able to, to, to not find ourselves underwater or underground and continue to be able to do these things. We're, we affirm that we'll do whatever it takes to continue to maintain our reserves, to continue to keep our AAA bond rating, continue to pay down our, our PS, Public Servant uh, uh, Retirement Fund, PSPRS, and not do what some other cities are doing, which opting to kick it down the road for 30 years. But we are aggressively and actively engaged on being responsible to make sure that we're doing what we need to do as a city, both for that retirement as well as taking care of it now. I, I personally don't like to throw things up in the air and hope that things will change radically in the future, that we can pay for something tomorrow that we can't pay for today. And this is coming from the mayor of one of the best run and financially successful cities, I, I dare say, in the nation. It's because that we've been very prudent with our policies that we continue to um, be able to say that. As was stated by Garrett, we're in the middle of, a, of a, a water issue in our community, and we're very serious about preserving and saving and conserving our water here. Not a drop goes out of down your drain that we don't look at at some level in the city and, and find ways to reuse, whether it's on grass or um, in Southern Chandler. Uh, but we also try to store as much water as possible. We have developed a very broad portfolio and it's spent millions of dollars to be able to do so, to make the most out of SRP and, and water from the White Mountains and cap monies and, and being able to be responsible with water that we pull out of the ground. So we've, we've recently, as you probably heard, have entered into an agreement with the Gila's to be able to also have water for them, Roosevelt Water Conservation District. So we've, we, we take water very seriously in Chandler. Not that we want to flout it and say, look, our, our grass is greener than the city across the, the street, but that we believe that in order to continue to attract quality businesses like Intel and to keep them there, we want to be able to prove that we can give them the important things that, that keep business going, of which, of course, water is one of the most important. So we take water very seriously, and I weighed in with other mayors on a letter that's in the, in the Capital Times, I believe, today about our city position on, on saying that we've done a very fiscal and, and very conservative response to water. We are neither hoarding but we are continuing to be prepared for the future and that will continue to be the position that we fight for as well as we look at water around our state. We're committed to our transportation infrastructure and interest. It's, as you know, a city 
even though we're fairly young, but we're over a century old, and some of our roads will continue to need attention. And we try to look at that. I, I remember one of my favorite stories with this is I was talking to a banker who, who complained to me about a certain uh, pothole cover and that every time he drove to work and went over this, he jiggled his coffee. Well, just by coincidence, I did absolutely nothing, but by the next time I came in, with that, that pothole had been identified and been repaired, and he kind of looked at me in awe, thinking that I had solved this. <laughs> Which is also a less, another lesson for being in the, in the sphere of public influence, is that you get a whole lot of credit for things that you have nothing to do with, but because we have a fantastic staff, you also get a whole lot of blame for things that you had nothing to do with. So they kind of work themselves out. We also are committed to making sure that our neighborhoods are safe and that people, um, they're, we're, they're not subject to, uh, to issues that go on with that. So we want our community to be places where people are proud to live, as well as continuing to make responsible development decisions with the land that remains in our community. I believe we're about 12% left, Micah, of, uh, in terms of build out, but most of that land has already been committed to one use or another, and it's just a question of when that happens. So there's gonna be continuing changes in our community and continuing challenges as we get closer to build out, as, as, in terms of making sure that we keep the open spaces that we have, in terms of fleshing out the park system that we've committed to within our community. There will be changes in terms of buildings uh, achieving greater heights and redevelopment, but it's exciting time to both serve and live in Chandler. Chandler continues to be an economic force within the greater Phoenix value, or, I'm sorry, Valley, but we want the announcement to be loud and clear. We're open for business. And I and our council are very committed to retaining and attracting a diverse mix of business to our community that will create new job opportunities for our residents and quality of life amenities for those who live here, those who work here, and those who visit our community. So I want to thank you. I'm trying to keep this brief so that you can, if you have any questions, you can ask them as well. So whether it's touring a new development, whether it's grabbing a bite to eat in our downtown or attending a community event, I do hope that you take time to enjoy everything that Chandler has to offer. It's been a privilege taking a moment to speak with you today. I hope that you will join me on February 21st at the Center of the Arts where we'll talk a lot more in detail concerning the vision of where we're going in Chandler. Uh, that'll be my, my State of the City address. It'll be a lot of fun. We'll be we're moving it back to the center of the arts where we have that beautiful foyer and theaters to be able to use. So doors open at five. I'll start my remarks at six. So I look forward to serving you as your mayor. Does anyone have any Thank you, mayor. questions? Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to uh, talk about the, uh, the council city update. So let's turn it over to um, Terry Rowe. Uh, Councilman Terry Rowe. Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor. Vice Mayor. Just, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Um, listen, I want to thank you all for being here. You are uh, you are not Fairweather friends and fans. You are uh, the, much of the face of the community here, and uh, you show up when things are good, and you show up when things are bad. And so uh, I love to run into you at events and have you... Uh, you know, I get to talk to you and have you say hello and then maybe share something that concerns you. So, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being a, a, a good partner in this community. Um, I, I will tell you, I want to thank the mayor and the council for uh, our recent decision to just reaffirm and, and our city manager, uh, who is also here, for uh, saying, look, let's, let's continue to uh, manage our finance. Uh, if we've got that right, if the federal government got that right, an awful lot of other things could go right. So, uh, so thank them for that. I'll, I'll tell you, um, $550 million is what a city close to us owes their retirees. And that is, um, and, and Chandler has an unfunded amount of $150 million. And Chandler has a plan to pay that off over the course of 11 years. 
and do that without raising taxes or um, uh, selling bonds or anything like that. No, no uh, voodoo economics. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of our community and its finance. Uh, I'll tell you, I also don't want to be known for the guy that talks about parking garages a lot, but, but I will tell you <laughs> that uh, with the help of the city manager and the rest of the council, we are getting uh, a brand new parking garage on the west side of Arizona Avenue. McCarthy is uh, killing it over there, building that, and uh, hopefully before the end of the year, there is going to be great parking in downtown Chandler. So a lot of things are going right. We need to keep it that way and keep moving the ball forward not over shoot goal. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, last night I shared a little bit of, uh, of this uh, sentiment at the end of our meeting. Um, our budget for 2019-20 uh, work began with city staff last year in August and we just completed a citizen survey from November uh, to the end of the last year. There was 995 respondents. 96% responded that we're doing an awesome job with uh, quality of life. 96% said we're doing a good job um, getting the maximum return off of your tax dollars. And 97% said they're happy with our overall city uh, services. So a great feedback. But what's exciting about it is on council last night we kicked off the budget. And um, I really feel, and you hear it from Terry, um, Vice, uh, Vice Mayor Terry and our Mayor Harkey, that Team Chandler is very cohesive in that same thought process that's delivering these type of results. And that, that's exciting to me. And, and we're, we're uh, shaping what uh, 19 and 20 is gonna look like in years to come. And um, as a finance guy, exciting times are upon us. I get geeked up about this. Uh, city manager, Marcia, looped throughout the gauntlet last night. She said, she'll see how excited I am at the end of the process. <laughs> She's still getting to know me. I only have one gear and it's go, maximum overdrive. So we'll, we'll see. But, uh, but I am excited and I will tell you like, on the survey, um, you could enter line item by line item feedback. And Marsha's already instructed city staff, anything that uh, on a staff level that they can take care of, they're knocking out. Anything that council we're prioritizing. Um, so your feedback matters. And so my, my main point is if you see me, myself, anybody on council, and you see something in the budget that we need to work on, give us feedback. And I hope next year we get 2,000 responses. Your opinion matters. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else in the city would like to give an update or, well, how about Jack with, from the Arizona Transportation? Would you like to say a few words briefly? Yeah, I, I probably have talked enough this morning, but uh, we, we really do have a funding issue with infrastructure in Arizona. And, uh, you know, when we talk about the fuel tax and, and what Representative Campbell is working on, you know, one of the things I preach to everybody I can talk to is that tax is a misnomer. It really is a user fee, and it's not even paying for maintenance right now. We need to, to somehow educate the public a little better on what our needs are. You know, we've got, particularly in Maricopa County, we've got pretty, pretty great infrastructure here now. There are some issues that we are working on addressing, but, you know, compared to other metropolitan areas, we're really in pretty good shape. And that's good news and bad news. The bad news is that the average voter says, I think we're in good shape. Why do we need it? Why do we need more money? Well, the reason we are in good shape today is because leaders 20 years ago knew how to plan for what, what we needed to have going forward. And I hope that 20 years from now, the people that look back will think that I and the other people that were involved in transportation also had a good plan. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Brian to give us an update for uh, from the Chandler uh, Chamber and public policy, please. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much, Garrett. Thank you for uh, presenting. I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what um, the Chamber of Public Policy is up to right now. 
Um, aside from monitoring everything down at the local level with the chair, uh, mayor and council, we appreciate their support. Um, right now, uh, as of yesterday, there was about 736 bills introduced at the state ledger, legislature. We are um, tracking about 214 of them. Um, if there is anybody that has any concerns about legislation that is out there um, on the business avenue, please get a hold of me or Terry um, to let us know any of your concerns. On the federal level, we have been weighing in and supporting our federal delegation to, um, as far as changes to the EPA water laws that went into effect uh, through the administration about a month and a half ago. We are also working with them and the U.S. Chamber in supporting them on trying to mitigate the effects of the uh, trade war as well as the government shutdown um, by signing on and supporting them in those sort of ways. So that's it. Thank you again for coming. And like I said, if there are any issues that you guys need from us, please let me know. Thanks. Thank you very much. Also, I want to thank uh, that award-winning book that we put out from the chamber, it's called How We Stand. If you have not seen a copy of it, take a copy. It's got quite a bit of information that would be appropriate for any questions you may have concerning the legislation. Uh, I want to thank you very much for coming. You've been a great audience. I'd like you to know that there's a couple things that are coming down the pike. Uh, February 8th, we're going to have District 17. Uh, Senator Mesnar, uh, Represent Wenger, and uh, we're also going to have on the same day our economic update luncheon. Uh, so February 8th is going to be a full full morning and uh, part of the afternoon. Um, the Arizona Commission is coming up on the 22nd and March 8th, uh, no policy impact. So please join us. Again, thank you. Uh, great audience. And it's with people like you that we make this thing go forward. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.